Hey guys, uh, so welcome back to my channel, and this is me, uh, Scylla. Uh, so, I know in my introduction video, I did decide that I was going to do crimes sort of based on things that happen to members of my community, so the LGBTQIA+. Um, but I decided I'm going to do those on a later video, um, mainly because I feel like the case I'm going to talk about today, it doesn't really get the recognition that I feel it deserves. Um, there's a lot of focus, a lot of uh, a lot of videos out there that focus on uh, murder and abuse of children, of women, and rightly so. Like These cases need to be talked about, and it's a way of giving legacy to the victims. But a crime that doesn't really get the recognition it deserves is the case of Kenneth Erskine. Now, he was a serial killer in the 1980s so throughout the summer of 1986 he murdered seven vulnerable elderly people and you know we always talk about uh children being vulnerable being innocent most them were the ones that we need to protect but on the other end of the spectrum we also have elderly people and I feel the same that elderly people as well are vulnerable and protection, especially you know when you get to 80 plus and you know you're living out in a care home you need people to help you do your daily life with your daily life you need people to help you feed change you and um, obviously some of them are bedridden so please give me a thumbs up give me a like give me a subscribe if you do like this content if not that's okay so in many documentaries that i have seen uh well, the few documentaries that i have seen they did describe kenneth as a gerontophile and um, what a gerontophile is is a paraphilia uh, very akin to paedophilia um, and it is basically gerontophilia is a sexual attraction to the elderly um, or sexual attraction to someone who is older than you um, something that's been sort of you know glamorized in everyday society you know uh, the term cougar the term milf or dilf whatever your sexual attraction is um but that is in between two consenting adults what kenneth was doing was something a lot different and obviously going after people who were in the most vulnerable of situations whereas obviously what you would consider a cougar so for example a 46 year old woman going after actively seeking a younger man and maybe dating a boy who's 20 because let's not forget obviously you may be considered as a young man and young man at that age your brain is actually still forming uh up until you are 25 years old so you may seem grown up, you may look grown up. I mean, certainly in my personal life, I actually have lived on my own since I was 18. And I thought I was incredibly grown up. But the silly mistakes that I've made back then still affect me to this day. And obviously I didn't realise at that time that my brain was still forming. Um, a lot of grey matter going on in your frontal cortex. The word gerontophile, it was actually first coined in 1901 by a psychiatrist, Richard von Kraft Eben. I don't know why I said it in that accent, but it just seemed like you would say it in that accent. Uh, so the word 
Geron is actually Greek for old person and philia meaning friendship. Now, obviously, Kenneth Erskine's case was a lot different. He was actively going out and assaulting his victims. But nine times out of ten, a person in a power of abuse, they do seek out the friendship beforehand before they show their true colours to build a rapport of trust um, which is obviously where the word philia comes from and it is the exact same as paedophilia so pedo is actually a word for child and obviously philia friendship because a paedophile would want to build a trust with that child you know they don't actively go out and seek their victims to harm them. They want to build up a report of trust. <clears throat> but I do want to point out that obviously gerontophilia, it isn't actually mentioned in the ICD, which is the International Classification of Diseases, because we are looking at diseases here. It's not a paraphilia is a disease. So, just to give you a backstory on who Kenneth Erskine was growing up, um, now I couldn't find a lot of information about him. Uh, what I could find was that he did show uh, violent tendencies from a very young age. So, he was actually born on the 1st of July in 1963. Uh, he was born in Hammersmith in West London. So, obviously, in Hammersmith Apollo, place like that. Um, he was born to an Antiguan father and a British mother. And I can only assume from my general knowledge of the 1960s, obviously growing up as a mixed race person, um, growing up in a mixed race family, couldn't have really been easy. You know, anyone who is watching and they grew up in that time, in that era, they would know what I'm talking about. Um... And so, as I stated, yeah, he did uh, so show signs of uh, violence at a young age. He twice got caught trying to hang his own brother. Um, he actually had three younger brothers. Um, and yeah, but he also tried to stab one of his school teachers. So, obviously, really, really great like yeah i have no words at this point i'm sort of dumbfounded and uh, it was my own brother um i mean he was labeled as a problem child and we obviously were growing up in the 90s uh so the attitudes from the schools back then thankfully have changed and have got a lot better but I'm not, for instance, saying that obviously anyone who was labelled as a proper child went on to become as heinous as what Kenneth Erskine is, but he, that's how he was labelled, uh, mainly because obviously he would he did assault teachers, but not to this level. Um, so obviously, if attitudes were different by then, obviously Kenneth would have been able to get the help that he so needed. Um, but he was actually chucked out of his family home at the age of 16 uh, after his parents found out that he had supplied his young, one of his younger brothers with cannabis. Obviously, it's not clear on which brother it was, if it was the one that he tried to hang or one of the other two. Um, I can't find any reports stating otherwise. Um, I just obviously want to point out that I'm only able to uh, access limited sources um as i stated in my introduction video um it was after this that kenneth spent his life with no fixed abode uh, so he would just sort of flow from place to place to place uh just obviously picking up where he could go and 
it was around this time that his criminal activity began. He started off uh, doing petty crimes, petty theft, uh, moving on to burglary and committing uh, social security fraud or what we would call benefit fraud, DSS fraud and so on and so forth. And it was with the proceeds of this money that he was managing to steal that he opened 10 bank accounts. 10. And this eventually led to him serving a sentence in HMP Felton. <clears throat> and it's around this time that obviously his fingerprints were kept on file so obviously that's something that we're going to come back to later when we talk about more serious crimes but the his prints being on file definitely helped him out and obviously as i already stated uh dna was its infancy at this point and i believe that is Probably the reason why so many murders went uh, unsolved for many, many years. It took many, many years to find uh, many of the very famous serial killers that are out there. You know, you think about how active the the Wests were, um, the Yorkshire Ripper, Ted Bundy, Dharma, Nielsen, uh, Dennis Nielsen. Nowadays, you don't necessarily hear about this. I think the last sort of uh, serial killer that I certainly heard about, I mean, I, because I don't really tend to watch the news, I don't really tend to read the news anymore, mainly because I find that it's not always factual. Um... And obviously they only post, they only put out what they want to put out. They don't print out the full story. And so you obviously you need to do a little bit of your own digging if you are interested in this field. So the summer of 1986, Stockwell was still recovering from riots which had taken place in neighbouring Brixton. Uh, in 1985 and the residents had to place all their trust in the authorities to catch Erskine. Uh, in 1986 was when Finns ramped up with his criminal activities and he began his, shall we say career, his criminal career uh, in murder. His first victim, Nancy Ems, she was born in 1908, uh, so she was 78 when she was murdered. And she was a retired teacher at this point. Um, I believe she may have possibly been a widow, but there's no sources stating so. Uh, so she lived in Wandsworth, uh, which... I believe it is a neighbouring town. Uh, and she lived in very squalid conditions, which, again, I wanted to point out with my personal belief that, you know, you can't really get any more vulnerable than the elderly. And, you know, on the spectrum of vulnerability, you have children at one end, you have the elderly at the other end. And... People like yourself, myself, we're able to look after ourselves so we're not really seen as vulnerable. Um, it wasn't until the next day that her body was discovered by her home help and she was tucked up in bed and bruising was found on her chest, marks around her neck, but in a bizarre sort of fashion, or a bizarre twist of fate, whatever you want to call it, her doctor had put her death down as natural causes. Now, I'm sorry, but you find a 70... Okay, so she's 78. But you find bruising on her chest and around her neck. 
That is something that you would investigate, surely. Like, you wouldn't look at that and think, oh, yeah, natural causes. Because it's not as if that sort of bruising is concurrent with a fall. <clears throat> you know, so, yeah, if they had done a, a far-right investigation, they would have discovered signs of serious sexual abuse as well. Because not only, obviously, was Erskine murdering these people, he was sexually molesting them, rape, uh, grope, whatever you want to call it. You know, he, he was doing that. Not only was he ending these people's lives, he was taking away their innocence, so to speak. Um, which is why, obviously, earlier on when I was talking about gerontophilia, that it is a paraphilia akin to paedophilia, in, in my op opinion. So it wasn't actually until Nancy's home help went to clear the flat and they discovered that the TV set uh, was actually missing that the post win finally took place and they discovered the bruising and noticed that her ribs were cracked. So it was suggesting that her body had been knelt on to strangle her after the discovery. And the forensics were finally called in to her to investigate. And they found a head hair in her bed with tests proving it to be an Afro-Caribbean head hair. So again, I just want to point out, and obviously with this head hair, in 1986, DNA was again very much in its infancy, um, which meant the police would have had to spend most times uh, cross-referencing, cross -referencing, I'm sorry, and would have been this all would have been done manually, which means paperwork upon paperwork upon paperwork. You know, computers again very much in their infancy, so you know they would have had to comb through air paperwork on every burglar and every rapist on file, and somehow try and fit the two. So Kenneth's second victim was Janet Cockett. Uh, she was 67, uh, born in 1919. And on the 9th of June, uh, <clears throat> Erskine had broke into her Wandsworth flat and carried out the same attack. And Janet was a recent widow. She was a mum and a grandmother, described as very outgoing. And she was actually the chairwoman of her local tenants association. Um, <clears throat> and just like Nancy, her body wasn't discovered until the next day with uh, bruising on her chest, around her neck. Uh, having... Again, her ribs crushed, suggesting obviously her body had been knelt on for him to perform uh, the asphyxiation. Quite bizarrely, Janet was actually found naked in her bed and she had her arms folded across her chest. And her nightdress was found to be torn, but also folded extremely neatly and put onto a chair and her family photos had been covered by a cloth um, and forensics actually uncovered semen stains on her bed covers which back in 1986 again pointed out that this was a new territory for forensics this isn't something that they I believe they didn't really uh see before so very very new in terms of what their basic technology was 
Um, obviously, with the photographing, uh, we're going to come back to that. Um, because that is something that he actually did perform out with um, the, most of his killings, actually. Uh, when the, the bodies were discovered, the photos were either placed down and or turn around or in obviously Janet's case her photographs were covered and many psychologists um they believed that it was to do with Kenneth's own guilt um and that he didn't want her family looking at him while he performed these unspeakable acts upon his victims and also discovered in the flat was a clear palm print on Janet's bathroom window which gave the forensics vital clues and obviously these prints are only useful if the person they belonged to had been arrested before because then obviously they were on file and Unfortunately, if they had done a bit more work and, you know, gone through everything more of a fine tooth comb, they would have, I believe, possibly caught Erskine a lot earlier. And as sad as it is, obviously, for the family of Nancy, I mean, again, I can't really find a lot of information on victims other than what I have already discussed uh, whether Nancy or not uh, had any family I don't know obviously as I already told you Janet was a mother she was a grandmother they could have spared other families the same sort of heart the same heartache that they had put or that Kenneth sorry had put uh these two families at. On June 27th at 3am, a 73 year old Frederick Prentice, he was asleep in his flat, uh, sorry, asleep in the care home in Clapham. And Frederick had woken up to a man kneeling on his chest strangling strangling him and shouting kill and he reportedly and frederick said that erskine was shouting this repeatedly kill 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 getting louder and louder each time um luckily frederick had managed to power press his alarm button which alerted the carers and unfortunately erskine had managed to escape but not before throwing poor Frederick against the wall and knocking the poor man unconscious. Uh, but Frederick's survival was the lead that the police obviously needed. That he was able to give a description of his killer. Uh, sorry, a description of his attacker. Um, unfortunately, uh, Kenneth's next two Vicky victims weren't as lucky um so again uh he breaks into a care home on the 28th of june um and he attacked two elderly men in their bedrooms and they actually lived in uh adjacent bedrooms to each other there was a Valentine Gleam, who was actually a World War II veteran. Uh, he was born in 1902, so he was 84 when he died. And I'm really, really sorry if I do muck up this name. It is a really, really long name. Uh, Zbigniew Strabava. I'm sorry. Um, he was 94. Uh, so he was born in 1892. So, again, he broke into a Stockholm care home and sexually assaulted both of the men. Again, he had knelt on their chests, so cracked ribs, the bruising around the throat. 
So you, you've definitely seen uh, Kenneth's MO, uh, modus operandi. His method of killing is very, uh, shall we say, intimate. Obviously, he's very close to his victims and he's actually got their contacts. <clears throat> and staff had actually told the police that they had heard unusual noises. Um, and it was discovered that Erskine had time to use one of the electric razors and actually have a wash. Now, if that were me in that position and this was going on in the car home that I worked in, I would go and investigate. Like, you know, especially at that age, you know, they're not going to be the most active people. They're not going to be, you know, if you're in a care home, you are looking at practically day-to-day -day care and help with those kind of daily tasks so they the cameras must have known that these guys were not up to doing that for themselves so it just blows my mind um it's one of the reasons just on a side note uh so i was 21 and i decided that i was going to get into health and social care myself and i went through the course and I actually passed my level one. Um, at the end of this course, I was actually placed into um, work, doing a day in a care home. And it was just, some of the things that I saw going on didn't sit right with me. Um, I really, and I felt so sorry for the people that living in this care home living in these conditions um obviously i reported them to the necessary channels that i had to report to uh, i believe there was an investigation but i don't know what the follow-up was from there because i not long after that moved away from that area um so i never really got any sort of follow-up from that uh but that has stayed with me for the past 10 years. Um, so this was obviously the end of 2013. It's now 2023. And it's something that has stayed with me. And something that I would never be able to get back into myself. Because of that. But I just know deep down in my conscience that if... If, if I did work there and I heard these noises, I would of course go investigate because you have, when you take on that role, you have a duty of care. And I believe that the carers abused that power and abused that power of trust. So it was only after these murders that the police began to uh, allow the media to release the information um, and bizarrely due to the hot weather that 1986 was having um, he Erskine was given the moniker the heatwave killer um, but obviously later on this was changed to the Stockwell Strangler He, on July the 8th, Erskine broke into the Islington flat of a William Carmen. Uh, he again was 84, again born in 1982. Uh, however, this murder was sort of seen as different as several hundred pounds had been stolen from William's flat. Um, but... As with the previous murders, William had been sexually assaulted before he was strangled. On the 21st of July 1986, Erskine returned to the same estate as Janet's in Stockwell 
and claimed his sick victim, William Downs. And William was 74, uh, born in 1912. And again, performed a very similar attack. And once again, semen stains were found on the bedsheets. And William was actually found under his bedsheets naked. Uh, was found by his son, Alan. Which... I can't really remember. I mean, I'm not particularly close to my father. Um, but I can't, still can't imagine myself going through that sort of uh, situation. But police had also found a large stain on the floor next to the bed, which, after testing, was found to be a mixture of blood and saliva. Um, this ascertained that William had been taken out of bed and laid face down on the floor. Um, and Erskine had then placed William back into his bed and had stuffed some sort of cloth in William's mouth. Um, and that is to obviously to swab any blood that was coming up from William's throat from the internal injuries. Again, fingerprints and palm prints were also found, which were matched to the print from Janet's murder. And from there, this is where the police discovered that they already had the prints on file. So the, this was the lead that the police were obviously looking for. Now, Erskine's final victim was 83-year-old Florence Tisdall. Uh, she was born in 1903, and she lived alone with her three cats in Fulham. And despite the news reports of the murders, she would also often leave her window open, and this was just to allow her beloved cats to come and go as they pleased. <coughs> Florence was described as a royalist, and this particular day, so the uh, 26th of July, was the actual royal wedding of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. And Florence had spent the day, or the morning rather, having her hair done. So even though she was watching the, watching the wedding from her flat, uh, on her TV, she wanted to look her best to sort of pay respects to the young couple. And sorry, the 23rd of July, I said the 26th. Um, just had it on a side note, obviously, this is uh, a new thing for me. So I'm just trying to look at notes that I prepared and I misread. A little bit there so I do apologize please be bear with me and I promise I will get better um but like I said I just really wanted to tell this case just to give obviously some legacy to some fo forgotten victims Now, Florence, like the others, had been strangled and she had actually suffered two broken ribs. And unfortunately, she had also been raped. And she was found later by her caretaker in her bed with her arms folded across her chest. Now, Kenneth was actually found in, uh, well, eventually rested, sorry. After it was found that he was cashing in his gyro at the Dow office. Now, back then, obviously, you didn't get an autobank payment uh, like you would now. You would actually get a gyro sent to you and you would go check it, cash it in, which meant, obviously, Kenneth was living somewhere, even though he spent a while being homeless. He had some sort of address to go and pick up his gyro. And it was the police that found this out. They phoned the local job centre and asked the staff to keep an eye out for a Kenneth Erskine if he did come in. And 
eventually he came in and the staff did graciously call the police to say that Kenneth Erskine had been in, that he was in the office at that moment and he was arrested and his trial began in January 1988 and during the proceedings and during the discussion of his crimes uh, he was actually seen laughing and giggling to himself uh, yawning at one point and even masturbating in the dock now you only have to look at that and know that obviously something isn't right um, he was eventually found guilty of the seven murders and he was tried for another two, uh, another four murders, sorry. Um, these included Wilfred Parks, aged 81, uh, so he was born in 19, 1905. And he died on the 2nd of June, 19, 1986, in Stockwell. And there was a Trevor Thomas, aged 75. So he was born in 1911, died on the 21st of July in Lambeth. But there was no sufficient evidence to charge Kenneth for these crimes. Uh, these are the only two that I could find. I couldn't find any information on the other two that Kenneth was tried for. And he was sentenced to life imprisonment with the recommended term of 40 years and... It was at this point he was found to have a mental age of an 11 year old. Um, and within the meaning of, and this was in within the meaning of the Mental Health Act in 1983. And in late 1988, he was transferred to Boardmore Hospital, a very famous uh, hospital for the criminally insane as housed people like uh, Peter Sutcliffe, uh, the Yorkshire Ripper. And he was detained there from 88 to 2016. And he's likely to be released and not be released until 2028, from f five years from now. So he is now, uh, he will be 65 when he is released. Or deemed fit for release. Um, a report in March referred to an assessment from September 2004 and it was included that Erskine had chronic, uh, chronic schizophrenia. Now obviously I do want to point that out that obviously mental health does need to be taken in and I'm, I am glad that obviously they did do these assessments. I think obviously mental health is very important. Um, personally, I've grown up around mental health with members of my family, unfortunately suffering from various mental health conditions. But obviously I'm not saying that every person with a mental health condition does turn out to be a murderer. He was also diagnosed with social personality disorder. Uh, and this has probably been the case since 1980. Um, July 2009, following an appeal, uh, Erskine's convictions were actually reduced to manslaughter. And this was done on the grounds of diminished responsibility. Now, I don't know how I feel about that, you know, it just feels wrong, like, it, yes, obviously, you know, he got the schizophrenia diagnosis, yes, he had uh, the mental age of an 11 year old at the time of the murders, but someone who has the mental age, in my understanding, I mean, obviously, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not trained in that field. But it doesn't take someone with the middle age of a child to carry out what he carried out. And I just don't feel, I think that's just 
a massive slap in the face for these victims. In 2016, a report stated that Erskine had been moved to a medium security hospital in Fatham in Berkshire. Uh, William Downs' son, uh, Alan, who was then 72 in uh, 2016, um, he was the one who found his father's body in his bed. And he said, he reportedly said, uh, people can change, obviously, and I can understand there. there's a move to begin. But the release process, sorry, there is a move to begin the release process. But can Erskine really be trusted? And that is the million dollar question. Can Erskine be trusted? You know, when five years time, when he is at fit for release, can he be trusted to go into the general population? Will the general population be safe from Kenneth Erskine? And I would like to know your thoughts and feelings on that. If you come across my video and you want to leave any of your opinions, that would be greatly appreciated. And I will, of course, read them. Uh, he, Alan went on to state that mentally he had forgiven him, but asked a question, had Erskine been truly assessed? And April this year, so 2023, only a few months ago, uh, an article was released stating that Erskine had been escorted for days out um, close to Fatham Hospital. And Alan, again, commented on this. He's now 79. And he stated that life should be life. And asked the question again, can people change? And they might think he's safe, but I wouldn't want him in my neighbourhood. He also stated that they always seem to go soft on people these days. But it's not appropriate for a serial killer like him. So it just seems to be that, you know, within that short amount of time that Alan's personal, um, and understandably, I agree with it, but his personal stance on this has changed. Um, I don't believe Erskine should have been let out of Broad War, um, but... I'm not the one there doing the assessments and obviously they haven't as of yet and I don't obviously think they will uh, but they haven't disclosed their um, reasons for doing that um, there was also a report in back in 2009 so we're jumping back to 2009 that Erskine actually saved the life of the Yorkshire Ripper uh, Peter Sutcliffe um, it was reported that someone had attacked uh, Sutcliffe in his room and Erskine and another patient had actually gone to help him. So, I mean, obviously they could have possibly looked at that and gone from there, but is that really enough for someone who carried out the attacks that Erskine carried out. Um, I really hope that you guys enjoyed this. Uh, maybe a little bit of a different, hopefully a different take on uh, this case. I think it's a case that doesn't get the recognition that it deserves. Um, and I would love to know your thoughts and feelings on this. I do apologise, obviously, Again, as stated, this is all new to me. Um, it's something I really wanted to do for a while. But it's just trying to obviously memorise all these different details. And obviously I had to have my notes in front of me. Um, just want to obviously know before anyone does comment that obviously I am doing this by myself. I'm filming, editing, everything by myself. And I only have my phone to do all this um 
So any thoughts and feelings that you have, any comments, please comment. I will read them. Any constructive criticism, I will of course take on board and to try and deliver the best content that I can deliver. Uh, so please give me a like, give me a subscribe and I'll be really appreciated. And you can also follow me on Instagram. I'll, I am under at the silhouette. And that's it. So if you guys want any other cases talked about, then again, please come in and I will look into them. Uh, there are a few cases in the back of my mind that I do want to do. Um, obviously going back to uh, what I was discussing, the possibility of looking into crimes against members of my community, uh, so the LGBT, and I've come across recently a couple of cases that I didn't know about, so I'm just going to do some studying and I will probably post another video next week at some point. Uh, but stay safe guys. And